Hello, everyone, and welcome to the practice reviewer orientation for the MCH Innovations Database Review. Um, thank you so much for participating as a reviewer. We are very appreciative of you volunteering your time to help us build the practice-based evidence base in maternal child health. My name is Laura Powis. I'm the program manager for evidence-based policy and practice at AMCHIP. AMCHIP's Innovation Hub is an online platform that aims to facilitate peer learning, build the maternal child health or the MCH evidence base, and identify and promote effective and equitable practices and policies grounded in evidence that will help make a collective impact on the impact on the well-being of individuals, families, and communities. You can access Innovation Hub by checking out the link provided on the screen. So Innovation Hub has three main buckets of resources. The first are our Explore resources, which includes our MCH, Maternal Child Health Innovations Database. Um, that's the bulk of what we're gonna be talking about today. We also have different opportunities that support folks in the field to build, the, build their work and replicate practices in the database, and that's through our replication projects, as well as implementation toolkits, which are specific to the national performance measures for Title V. Um, and we also have a lot of resources on the website that have to do with uh, the process for sharing uh, your work or other work with the database, so um, that goes through the database submissions process. So first we're gonna deep dive into the MCH Innovations Database. So the MCH Innovations Database, the goal of the database is to build the MCH, the Maternal Child Health Evidence Base by identifying and sharing effective practices and policies from the field that benefit maternal child health populations. We often get asked, how do I know if my work is a good fit for Innovation Hub? What kind of work are you looking for? Um, we really think of the hub as a growing repository of what's working in MCH. So that is inclusive of programmatic practices and initiatives, collaboratives and coordinated structures, workforce development strategies, family and community engagement and partnership strategies, toolkits and curriculum, as well as big and little p policies. Big p policies being more governmental policies and little p policies being more administrative policies. Um, so really, essentially, if something is working and having a beneficial impact on MCH populations and could be replicated by others, it's likely a fit for our database. So we all have different paradigms and understandings for thinking about evidence. Some people might think about research studies or large scale evaluations. Others might look to peer reviewed literature or state data. Still others might think of the perspectives of people with lived experiences um, and community preferences as examples of evidence. Antrip thinks of evidence holistically to include also research evidence, but other types as well. So that includes contextual evidence, which is inclusive of community-defined evidence, community preferences, experiences, and input, um, as well as state needs assessment data, experiential evidence, which includes perspectives of people with lived experience and professionals and practitioners, and then also the research evidence, which might be randomized controlled trials, so experimental and quasi or non-experimental designs as well. When folks submit their practices to the database, it's evaluated along a practice continuum that ranges from cutting edge all the way up to best. And so the way that our continuum works is everything, um, as you move up the continuum, that practice must have met all the requirements for the preceding uh, designation. So for example, a cutting edge practice, and we'll talk more about this in detail later on, but a cutting edge practice addresses a need, uh, benefits a specific MCH group, advances health equity, involves and partners with stakeholders, and shows signs of success. Uh, an emerging practice, in addition to those cutting edge, cutting edge attributes, also has an evaluation plan and has started some quality improvement work. Promising practices build upon emerging practices to also um, share out their data from their evaluation. So they're actually being able to demonstrate the impact that they're having, um, talking about unintended outcomes, considering bias, and really conducting a more robust process for quality improvement. And a best practice meets all of those preceding requirements and then also has been replicated in another location or with another setting with similar positive results. Um, and meaningfully engages stakeholders across all practice level and has been disseminated in some way. So currently in our database, you'll see that we have over 175 practices, which we are so thrilled about. And you'll see that the bulk of these kind of land in the emerging and promising section. 
um, with the fewest being a best practice. And that's just because that designation is sort of the most rigorous designation to receive. Um, for cutting edge practices, cutting edge practices are in the database for two years. So they are not a um, long term feature. They are not featured permanently in the database, but um, we work with cutting edge practices through something called our cutting edge learning community to sort of support their work and build their work and um, support them to grow. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Noelle, who's going to talk a little bit more about the practice submission steps. Hello. So yes, this will be the section on the submission steps review. And so the submission process is really three main steps, which is first to complete the submission form. And we will talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, once we receive the submission form, if accepted, uh, practices submitters will be completing the database entry survey, uh, which is just filling out a lot of the information about their practice. And then afterwards, the third and final step is to complete a practice summary and implementation guidance handout, which we'll see in the next couple of slides. So before someone submits an application to be accepted into the Innovation Hub, into our database, we have lists of criteria that they can use to kind of determine which submission form might be best for them. Similar to our practice continuum, this kind of uh, works parallel to that in that each designation has its own set of criteria. Um, and again, every, uh, like similar to how it was previously explained, like the emerging practice will build off of things that the cutting edge designation would have already put up in place. And just like that, they will also move forward through all of these criteria before selecting uh, the appropriate submission form. So the submission forms uh, look like this. We have a different submission form for each designation. Um, once, you know, working through the minimum criteria checklist on the previous slide, uh, practices and submitters will pick the appropriate submission form that, you know, can vary in length. Of course, the cutting edge is our shortest submission form as those are usually for uh, practices and policies that are not policies, sorry practices that are in their earlier stages, whereas the best practice submission form will be much longer as it will require more information before being accepted into the database. And completed forms will then be sent to the evidence at amchip.org um, email inbox where our team will review them afterwards. So the final step, as previously mentioned, is this practice summary and implementation guidance handout, which has a lot of information. This is what, if you go to our database, this is what you will see on our website. Every practice that is accepted into the database will have a form that looks like this. It will have lots of information starting from basic things such as where the practice is and what community it serves, as well as things like uh, how the practice is carried out, implemented, what kind of groups of people are involved, budget, all of that information can be found in this handout on our database. Thanks, Noelle. And with that, um, now that we've kind of gone over the process for submitting your work, we're going to now do a bit of a deeper dive into what you will be doing as a reviewer. So now we're going to go into the steps for being a reviewer. So it takes about three hours total to be a reviewer. The first step being to watch the orientation. So congratulations, you've already done that. That's this video here. Uh, next, you're going to complete a doodle poll to schedule your review call. Your review call is where you come together with your two other fellow reviewers to talk about the practice you were assigned and to discuss if they met the criteria that they needed to go over um, any submission clarification that they, you have received and to really get a sense of um, does this practice meet the designation it's submitted for. Next up, you score your practice. And so I find that that takes about an hour depending on the length of the practice. It'll take a bit longer to uh, score a best practice versus a cutting edge practice, for example. Um, and what's do, new for this review that we haven't done before is we are requesting submission clarification up front. So previously, if you've reviewed with us before, after the review call, we would go back to the practice and ask for feedback or, or uh, clarification on anything that you as the reviewer team felt you needed more answers to before you could actually give a final designation to the practice. We're now asking for that up front. So you will see that on the um on your score form, there's a place for you to include what questions you want answered ahead of time. 
So we're going to be reaching out to practices before the review call. Um, so when you then do the next step, which is participating in the review call, our goal is that at the end of every review call, we will be able to determine the final practice designation. Um, the reason for this change is we found that uh, sometimes there can be kind of like a communication lull and the, the, uh, the review drags on a little bit longer than we would like it to. Um, and then we've told our, the practices that uh, it will drag on. So we're trying to just be more transparent um, about why that change happened and we're trying this out. So maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. And we appreciate you bearing with us. Um, the last and final step is to complete the AMCHIP feedback survey. Um, so that'll be something that you're asked to complete after the review. We really take the results of this seriously um, and are very serious about quality improvement. So um, we super appreciate you taking the time to fill out that survey and we do make changes based on it. All right, so next up, scoring. So submissions are reviewed by a team of three reviewers, as I mentioned, who are matched to a practice based on expertise and assess the submission according to the criteria related to each respective designation. One thing we're excited to share is that we are now working with youth reviewers and our goal is to have every youth related submission be reviewed by at least one youth reviewer. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. So the overall goal of our review is to identify practices that others may benefit from replicating. Our aim is to be inclusive within reason. Um, so I just want to highlight that our continuum really allows for different levels of rigor. So as you're reviewing, um, you're going to be thinking it in a slightly different lens if you're reviewing a cutting edge practice versus a best practice. So if a cutting edge practice does not have evaluation data, that is okay. That category is designed for practices that do not have evaluation data. Um, similarly, if you're thinking about stakeholder engagement or stakeholder involvement, what we expect of a best practice is at a higher level than what we might expect of a cutting edge practice. Um, that's in part because we work with cutting edge practices to grow their practice. Um, and there are opportunities for growth and refinement um, associated with the database. So as I mentioned, that's in part through our cutting edge learning community and we also are open and willing to working with um, practices and other designations too, to kind of address any concerns that reviewers might have had during uh, the review process. So lastly, we just encourage you to consider the bandwidth for the program and what resources they have available to them when evaluating. Um, an example of this might be a community-based, a smaller community-based organization probably has different resources at its disposable at its disposal for evaluating their practice than say a practice grounded out of a academic institution. So we're wanting to take an equity centered lens when we're thinking about this to try to ascertain what is a program's bandwidth um, and not unfairly uh, judge or not take an overly critical lens. And so this is part of why we have the review call is so that we can come to consensus together as a team um, so if you're really struggling on what to score something, that's okay. You'll have a chance to talk about it with your full review team. All right, so our score form. So each designation has a different score form. Um, the score form includes uh, spaces, like I said, to provide submission clarification as well as feedback. We'll talk about the feedback piece in a little bit more detail here in just a moment. Um, but what you'll do essentially, and we're going to do a scoring deep dive together, so you'll really see this in, in more nuanced ways, but you'll see there's like a point system associated with each question. So you'll provide a, uh, a point score, and then if needed, you will um, explain your reasoning. And this helps facilitate the review call um, to kind of go into it knowing what some of the points of concern might be. So for the directions. A practice must score two points that meets expectations on every cut and every question to receive the designation of cutting edge, best practice, any designation, you need to have all the questions receive that two points. For any question that you score fewer than two points, you'll be asked to explain why you gave the score. There's a space on the score form under each question for you to explain your reasoning. If the applicant answers a part of the question elsewhere in the submission, you can totally use that information for any relevant question. So for example, if you are looking at the health equity question and you found that in the practice description um, section of the submission form, folks talked about something relevant to health equity, you can use that information to inform your score in the health equity session. That is completely okay to do. And as I mentioned, a final practice designation will be 
uh, given based on the reviewer consensus during the review call. And then on the last page, you'll be able to provide feedback that will be shared with the submitter to strengthen and enhance their practice. And then as I noted, um, for youth reviewers, any questions that you do not feel comfortable scoring, you can select the, the um, NA option on the score form. So for example, um, when we talked to some youth who reviewed our materials, they mentioned that for some of the evaluation questions, they didn't know that they could score it appropriately because they weren't familiar with evaluation methodologies. Um, so we've included that option. We encourage you as much as you're comfortable to provide scores. Um, and you'll have a chance to talk about them on the review call. But there's also that option if there's a question you really just don't feel like you can answer, you can absolutely select that box. So here is an example score form, uh, question on a score form. So say for the practice description, you'll see that we have a point system of zero to three with the NA option for youth reviewers. Um, and so in general, zero means that it does not meet the expectations at all. So that might be if in a response to a question, they don't even talk about the question they're meant to be answering. They're just talking about something completely unrelated. A one is partially meets expectations. And so for each question, we kind of uh, write out what we would mean by a one. Um, so for this one, for the practice description, they've provided some of the information that was asked for, but not all of it. Two of meets expectations, the applicant provides adequate info on the needs of the practice address, um, the population it impacts, and what the practice intended to accomplish. And so you'll see if you look at the question, that's fully answering all components of the question. Um, and for exceeds expectations, the three, the reason we have threes on the score forms is we offer different um, awards to folks on um, who submit to Innovation Hub at our conference. And so um, we sponsor some folks to attend our conference. And so um, the threes, that, that's where kind of the sum of the whole score comes into play. So that's why we offer the threes as a way to differentiate who might be those award winners for our awards. And so in this kind of teal box here at the bottom, the required for any score other than a two or a three, that's where you'd explain why you provided your score if you chose something that didn't was below meets expectations. So as I mentioned, the submission clarification, this piece is new. Um, so this used to take place after the review call, but we're asking it on the score form directly. Um, so what you'll do is if you're reviewing your submission and you're like, I think this could be a good fit, but I have some questions about how they engaged with their partners, with their stakeholders. What you'll do is I want you to think about what questions would you want answered? What additional information do you feel you need in order to feel comfortable um, selecting a final designation for this practice? So we ask you only include questions that you feel must be answered in order for you to feel confident in including the practice in the database or giving them the, uh, the designation they applied for. Um, sometimes we've noticed with folks during submission clarification, uh, folks will be asking questions just based on curiosity as opposed to really feeling like they need the answer to make a final decision. And so that's really why um, we're trying this approach just out of respect to the submitters and reviewers time. Additionally, um, you have the opportunity to provide feedback. So this is something we've gotten feedback from the uh, folks who submit their work to us that they really appreciate. One of the benefits of submitting to the database is that even if you're not selected to be featured, which is, which is rare, we do our best to try to um, work with folks to be accepted. They have the opportunity to receive fe constructive feedback from the team of expert reviewers who are reviewing their practice. So we structure our feedback in that continue start stop framework. So continue is really highlighting things that you think the practice is doing well and should keep doing and expanding. Start are areas of growth for the practice. So it's something that you think the practice would benefit from starting to do that it sounds like they're not doing already. And stop are suggestions for discontinuing any activities that you think are harmful or are perpetuating inequities. There's also an opportunity to talk through um, all of the feedback on the review call. So we'll kind of consolidate the feedback from you and your other reviewers on the review call. So as I mentioned before, questions really scale up. So questions scale up from one practice designation to the next. Um, there are kind of continuous questions that you'll see across the different submissions if you're reviewing more than one submission type. Um, 
And we really view this as a technical assistance opportunity and expect different things from a cutting edge versus a best practice, as I mentioned. All right, so a note on health equity. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation defines health equity as everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and healthcare. Um, so we expect different things from different practices related when you're thinking about health equity, um, but all of our practices, we are committed to not including any practices in the database that we feel like are not in some way addressing health inequities um, or systemic oppression, such as structural racism. Um, so there's an opportunity at the end of the form to provide more feedback on how a practice could better center health equity, um, but it is something that we are really requiring and expecting all practices to be thinking about or addressing um, in alignment with sort of how AMTRIP's commitment to anti-racist work and um, promoting health equity through all of our practices and programs. So as I mentioned earlier, when we are thinking about the evidence to support a practice, we're thinking about that evidence term inclusively so and holistically. And so if you, when considering for a promising or a best practice, when considering the evaluation data that is being given, we are including not just evidence coming from research evidence, but also experiential evidence and contextual evidence. So that might be more qualitative evidence. Um, so for folks, especially who have more of a, um, a quantitative research background, um, this might be different than what you're typically um, doing in your own work. Um, so that's sort of why we make this note on it here. Just encouraging folks to think about evidence holistically. And if you have any questions on is the evidence pro provided adequate, uh, we can talk about that on the review call. So just make a note on your score form and we can bring talk about that together. And sort of similarly, uh, noting for evaluation, we recognize many forms of evaluation is valid, and we ask that you consider bandwidth and resources available to a practice when thinking about their evaluation plan. Uh, again, there's an opportunity to offer feedback, and um, our, the what we're expecting from practices in terms of their evaluation really does scale up across the designation. So we're an emerging, it's just their plan. Promising, it's their plan and data demonstrating impact. And for a best practice, it's their plan, data demonstrating impact, and data demonstrating impact on health inequities and or systemic oppression. Lastly, we want to make a note on bias, because this is a sticking point for a lot of people. There's a question in our score form related to bias, and what we mean by bias is not just statistical bias. Um, thinking we're also or bias in your evaluation. Um, bias occurs when we interpret our data findings in a specific way based on our points of view. Um, this can cause us to disregard other valid interpretations. Some example of bias could include conducting an evaluation survey that was not written in someone's native language, participants providing responses that they think evaluators want to hear or seem favorable. And I'll also note that bias can also happen in how you're implementing your practice. So it's not necessarily just about evaluation. Um, so when looking at folks' answers related to bias, we want to be thinking about it holistically and comprehensively. Wonderful. So breaking down the review process. Um, so submission materials were posted on our website. Um, their submission forms were due to evidence at amchip.org. And then uh, our wonderful reviewers uh, receive their assignments. And so you'll have received your assignment if you've already, um, if you're watching this video. And you're going to have about three weeks um, to review your assigned practice. So we will let you know in that email when your score form will be due back. Um, Reviewers, you'll also complete that doodle poll for the review call. Um, reviewers will then participate in your 45 minute review call. And then practices will be contacted with a final decision. So usually this process takes about two months, um, give or take, and we're really working and doing our best to try to keep it within that window. A lot of it won't relate to you, the two month process for reviewers, it's more of about a month that we're contacting you from when you receive your submission to when the review calls are held. Um, that all happens within a month's time. So you will submit your completed forms to evidence at amchip.org. Um, so you'll email your forms to us uh, there. And then what we're going to do is consolidate all your responses um, with your other reviewers' responses and scoring um, to prepare for the review call.
All right, so now we are going to actually go through some sample scoring questions together. This is feedback we got that folks wanted a more in the weeds run through of what scoring a practice looks like. So we are gonna do this together. All right, so we're gonna go through a practice question together. For this example, we're going over the practice collaborators and partners question. So the question relates to describing practice collaborators and partners and why they were partnered with. So uh, the example that we're gonna look at is our goal is to ensure that content contributors to the toolkit are diverse in conditions, outcomes, and demographics. We recruited a content review work group with the same diversity goals to ensure that we are creating content that is applicable to the audience we are serving. We offer the training to all constituents of, collab of coalition member organizations at no cost. So looking at our score form, where do we think this lands? Um, so the question asks us to describe um, who the collaborators and partners on and explain why they were invited to partner on this practice. So looking at this response, we would actually give this one a zero because they do neither of those things. Uh, they did not mention who their practice collaborators or partners were or why they partnered with them. So I would give this a score of a zero and explain my reasoning in the required score box below. So let's look at a similar but different response. So we started with building a coalition of patient advocacy organizations that represent the top contributors of maternal mortality and morbidity, including physician groups, birth worker advocacy groups, and individuals with lived experience. We recruited a content review work group and offered the training to all constituents of the coalition member organizations at no cost. Um, apologies, I'm in a thunderstorm, so if it's a little crazy behind me or you hear thunder, that's what's going on. So how about this, uh, where would we score this example? So in looking at this example, I would score this as a one because the practice did describe who the collaborators and partners were, but they did not explain why they were invited to partner with the practice or indicate um, their lived experience. And again, I would uh, include my reasoning in the uh, required box below. So looking at this answer, we have, we started with building a coalition of patient advocacy organizations that represent the top contributors of maternal mortality and morbidity to ensure that those underserved populations have equal opportunities to have their voices heard. This group includes physician groups, birth worker advocacy groups, and individuals with lived experience. Our goal is to ensure that content contributors to the toolkit are diverse in conditions, outcomes, and demographics. We recruited a content review work group with the same diversity goals to ensure that we are creating meaningful content that is applicable to the audience we are serving. We offer the training to all constituents of a coalition of coalition member organizations at no cost. So thinking of this example, I would score this one as a two. The reason I'm thinking that is they both talked about who their collaborator and partners were, and they explained why they were invited to the practice. Um, additionally, at least one of the partners had lived experience um, and comes from the key practice that, that is impacted. And in this case, it was folks with lived experience related to maternal, maternal mortality or morbidity. So this I'd score as a two, and I don't need to explain my answer because I'm meeting expectations, but if you wanted to provide any input, you absolutely can. Last but not least, we have, we started with building a coalition of patient advocacy organizations that represent the top contributors of maternal mortality and morbidity to ensure that those underserved populations have equal opportunities to have their voices heard. This group includes physician groups, birth worker advocacy groups, and individuals with lived experience. Our goal is to ensure that content contributors to the toolkit are diverse in conditions, outcomes, and demographics. We recruited a content review work group with the same diversity goals to ensure that we are creating a meaningful content that is applicable to the audience we are serving. We ensure that people with lived experience are key decision makers in all coalition actions to ensure that their voices are centered and power is adequately shared. We offer the training to all constituents of coalition member organizations at no cost. So for this one, I would score this as a three. It meets all the expectations um, from before, but I really liked what they said about power sharing and about centering the voices of people with lived experience. And so that for me would kind of meet the expectations of a three. 
I want to make one more note for youth reviewers. If you were going through and you saw this question, you were like, I really don't know if this, uh, I don't feel like I could answer this. You're absolutely available. It's absolutely okay for you to check the NA youth reviewer box. Um, and we'll still talk about this question on the review call. So I hope that was helpful to kind of go through what scoring looks like. That was obviously just for one of the questions on the score form, um, but the same kind of thinking about scaling up for um, what we expect or what a zero to a three answer would be applies to all the different questions. If you have any questions at all as you're reviewing, please email us at evidence at amtrip.org and we are more than happy to answer your questions. And we just want to say a sincere thank you again for taking the time to review for Innovation Hub. We really could not do uh, the work we do without your dedication. So thank you so much and happy reviewing.